Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming yet again. You are people of great endurance and great goodwill. I thank you very much for coming to yet a third lecture by me. Um, I am so pleased to be here. And thanks very much to Migimo and to all of the people who made this possible. So today what I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about is the research I'm doing now. The first two lectures I gave were about research that I've already wrapped up. I've already completed the books for that. This is a project I'm starting now and so it's less polished. There are a lot of things I do not know about this topic, but uh, many of you are interested in doing this kind of research, and so I thought it might be useful to hear what it looks like when you're halfway through, and you don't know how the research will come out, and you don't know what all the answers are. So this, I got interested, I'm, I want to talk, this project is about how uh, we could or should develop governance mechanisms for the cybersecurity field. Uh, cybersecurity is a hot topic. My students in the United States, a great many of them, are interested in cybersecurity problems. And it is an area of policy making where there is a great deal of uncertainty. Often people say there are no rules. I'm going to argue there are indeed a lot of rules, but there are a lot of people who want to make new rules, change rules. How that happens is an interesting problem for an international relations scholar. It's a very international space. We're all on these same networks. We're sharing that space. So how do we all live in this space? is an important research problem, I think, for us as scholars. But also, I want to talk today about some of the policymakers who have to make hard choices in this space. The diplomats, but also the technical people, uh, who, and the business people who are involved in this. So, I am not a technical person. I have no engineering skills whatsoever. Uh, my children, who are both uh, employed as software developers, uh, laugh at me every time they come home because I am not smart about my smartphone. My smartphone is smarter than I am. Uh, but, um, so the irony here is that, um, well, I should backtrack this. I do, one thing I am interested in though and have been interested in since I left university is I'm interested in how people make technology about policy because I think this is a hard problem. Decision makers don't understand technology just as I don't understand technology, but the people who make a lot of the decisions they're making decisions about things they don't understand. So how that conversation between expertise in technology and political power and decision making, how those people communicate is a really interesting problem. So here I am with no technical expertise, uh, but I, as if you came to the previous lectures, you know that I'm very interested in norms and have been working on norms for many years. Uh, and uh, I spent in the international relations field a long time trying to persuade other international relations scholars that norms were real, they existed, they were important, they were powerful, my realist friends were dubious. So we had this conversation. And imagine my surprise then when about five years ago I started to get phone calls not from realists, not from international relations scholars, from the Pentagon. Where, and, and the people, I think the first round of calls I got, uh, that these were people in the Pentagon who wanted norms. Uh, the first uh, call I think I got was from uh, a, a fellow who wanted, uh, this was, it turns out the United States has an ambassador to space. I've met him. Uh, I did not know there was such a person. Uh, and uh, he wanted to talk to me about norms. They wanted norms for space. Uh, it turns out he was a charming man. Uh, it was, it turns out what they were, the policy problem for them was um, a great many people are now shooting stuff 
stuff up into orbit, a lot of that stuff actually then is designed to break or self-destruct or explode, and space junk garbage is a huge problem for them. We do not have uh, outer space vacuum cleaners to clean this stuff up. So they needed rules about, you know, clean up your mess or whatever the rules were going to be. How could this happen? Um, so uh, actually, uh, I never heard back from him. I think they have no norms for this. But, but the next round of people I got calls from at the Pentagon and elsewhere were people interested in cybersecurity. Uh, they wanted norms, uh, 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 it, and it was not just the Pentagon that was pushing for new norms in this space. Um, it turns out that lots of states have been interested in cybersecurity norms. Businesses are interested in cybersecurity norms. Civil society groups are interested in cybersecurity norms. And there's been a lot of activity in this space. Um, uh, the UN has a Group of global uh, group of government experts. The UN GGE process started in 2004, 2005, um, trying to agree on cyber norms among states. I mean, the UN is an organization of states, so these are state representatives uh, trying to. Uh, negotiate what kind of norms and rules or laws we could put together. Some of these conferences have been more successful, some less successful. I think your own Professor Kurtzky has been involved in almost all of these. He's been at this for a very long time. But there's also a London process, a global conference on cyberspace. Now we have an open-ended working group at the UN interested in cyber norms that's running in parallel with the GGE process. So it's a very active space. The research question for me as an international relations scholar and as a political scientist, well, there are at least two of them. One is, why are these people so interested in norms? Um, why, if you're a policymaker, are norms an attractive tool for you? Why would you want to pursue norms as opposed to treaties, law? other kinds of things you could do to manage and govern this cybersecurity problem and this policy space. And the second research question, and, and this is why I was getting these phone calls, was if you are a policymaker who wants some norms to govern your space, how do you do that? How do you build norms on any topic that might interest you? And, and this has been a very active area of research as a general matter for international relations scholars since the 1990s. Work on promoting norms, on the activities of these norm entrepreneurs who are pushing new norms, creating new norms, persuading people of new norms. That's been around now for more than 20, 30 years probably in international relations scholarship. So, so the research question is, can we apply any of this to the cybersecurity field? I don't know. And, and how would that work? So just to be all good, social science starts with a definition of terms. So uh, my definition of a norm uh, would be that a norm is a a collect, is a set of collective or shared expectations about proper behavior, correct behavior, for actors with a given identity. So norms are a very particular kind of policy tool, and they have discrete components. Let me march through a few of these. Norms. Uh, Logically, first, uh, first of all, they, they take a particular form, norms do. Norms take the form, good actors do X. Good states do this. Good people do this. So, good states don't torture their prisoners might be a norm. Or in the cybersecurity context, a norm might be no one should commenteer ICT, international communications and tel uh, technology resources for use of botnets. Botnet, botnets are bad. We don't like botnets. So no one should commandeer these networks for botnets. Uh, or maybe the norm should be um, we should disclose if you find a vulnerability in software, you're 
obligated good actors disclose vulnerabilities to the manufacturer so they can fix it. I mean, you could sell the exploit, make a lot of money. Many people do. This is an active market. But public spirited people would disclose to the manufacturer so it could get fixed. So there are a whole array of norms that you could construct. And a norm always has this form. Good actors do X. Um, so a norm is a shared expectation. Uh, and it is powerful because we all share this idea. Um, so at some level, this relates back to the comments I made about social facts uh, earlier in the week. I mean, norms have this shared belief quality. Uh, it is not a norm because I stand up and announce and say, this is a norm. It, that might be a proposal for a norm, but if I can't persuade you that this is a good norm, this norm is going nowhere. So uh, norms only exist because we all share a belief in it. Another interesting feature of norms that's important for the cybersecurity field is that different kinds of norms apply to different kinds of actors. And this is important in cybersecurity because very different kinds of actors are at work involved with these networks. This is a policy space that has States involved, states are very interested in cybersecurity. There are businesses, I would argue, at the core of cybersecurity because the businesses build and own the networks. So, but what you would expect a state to do, what would be good behavior for a state, appropriate behavior for a state, might be quite different than the rules or expectations we would have about what a good business should do. Businesses just do different work in this space than states do. And both of those are different from what good citizens should do. And you could have different norms for citizens and users like you and me. Businesses who build the software, build the technology, build the hardware. Or states who might be in interested in throwing around their political power to regulate what's going on. So we should expect a diversity of norms, different norms for different kinds of actors. The norms have a, a, are an interesting policy tool um, a, in that they have this shared expectation quality. Um, I, th I think one of the reasons this is attractive to policymakers is they think that norms are going to be nimble, that they might change more easily than treaties. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, but this is the hope that uh, many policymakers have. Another feature of norms that um, I think often is unclear to policymakers in this space is that we don't have to like norms to feel the pull of the shared expectations. That there are a lot of norms that there's no norm police out there, no one's, enforced, no one's forcing you to do things, but you don't particularly like them and you do it anyway. So, for example, my favorite example of this would be high-heeled shoes for women and neckties for men. Right? None of us would choose to wake up in the morning and put these things on, but we do it. because you, On Saturday morning, you probably don't do this thing. But we do it because it is expected. It is what makes us fit in with the larger group that we identify with. In the same way, you, though that, kind of exp, uh, that kind of expectation and compliance pull can be put on states and businesses. It is the right thing to do. Businesses understand what good engineering looks like. There are clear expectations about this. They want to build a good product. So they do things that might be more expensive, have other costs, even though they might chafe under it, they might go, oh, do I have to? But they do. So, the, uh, so I'm, I'm curious about sort of how it is that um, policy people react to these norms. Um, and I've particularly been interested in why they are so many policy people interested with so much enthusiasm on this topic. Certainly in the West, this is true. Not everybody's as enthusiastic about the norms as the folks in the West. Russia has a different attitude towards some of these things. They, it's a more legalistic kind of conversation here. I'll be curious to hear your views on this. 
but globally, this is a very popular, there's a lot of enthusiasm. I'm advising a global commission on cyber stability that it has representatives from, I think we're up to 30 countries on it, that they're all into this norms business. Why? Why are these policymakers so interested? I, can th I don't have the whole answer to this, but I have at least three candidates. I can see at least three reasons, and they're not mutually exclusive. I think one reason that the, one very uh, localized reason for why there's an enthusiasm for cybersecurity norms, as opposed to, for example, a treaty, is that treaties for the United States are really difficult, especially right now. They're always difficult, just structure, structurally, but right now it's very hard. I mean, treaties require ratification by the U.S. Senate, uh, getting, if you follow the news, you know this, getting anything through our very dysfunctional U.S. Senate these days is almost impossible. It is just gridlock like this. It's always been hard, but it's particularly hard now. If in parliamentary systems, I think this is less of a problem. It's a particular idiosyncratic problem for the United States. But I hang out in the United States, and a lot of the cybersecurity conversation happens around American technology. So I think it is important. The, the second reason I think uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm about cultivating norms in this space it is more fundamental and touches every aspect of the problem. The pace of technological change is so fast in this area that it is far outstripping the pace of bureaucratic and government mechanisms to regulate it. So there's a disconnect here. The pace of government, the pace of regulation, the pace of treaty making is very slow. And the pace of technology is very, very rapid. So the worry is that you would invest a lot of money into an international treaty or some legalized instrument that took years and years to negotiate. By the time you got it wrapped up and completed, the technology is already somewhere else and it's irrelevant. I mean, the people have these memories of negotiating the Law of the Sea Treaty, which took, I think, 20 years, I mean, some very long period of time. They're not going to wait around 20 years for governance, for for rules in this space. And I think actually this is a generic problem for a lot of technology policy. Um, think about international uh, artificial intelligence. This is a problem. We don't have good rules there. We don't have good rules on biotechnology. So if you think back to the um, episode in China last year with uh, CRISPR technology was used to create uh, a human baby. Uh, there was a big uproar about this, often in the scientific community. This broke a lot of norms of bioethical research in the scientific community. Uh, and there are not good rules about what one should do now that these babies are here. So um, this is a basic structural problem in policymaking. Technology changes faster than law. Technology changes faster than treaties. How can you fill that gap? Um, the hope, I think, uh, in the policy community is that norms will be a more flexible instrument and help fill that gap. Um, the third uh, feature that I think makes norms an attractive policy instrument uh, is that norms as a governing mechanism, as a way of coordinating behavior, are very decentralized. All kinds of actors, every kind of actor, can create shared expectations in their very small local community, in the larger community, somewhere in this cybersecurity space. Uh, so the power and authority, what I mean by that is business, business community develops its own norms, uh, and a lot of this is very informal. It just is a behavioral repetition, it's habit, it's competition that converges on certain sets of expectations about what good software looks like, how we manage certain kinds of technical problems. There is actually a very deep level of shared norms in the technical community about building a lot of the software and hardware that underlie these networks. Um, 
and this is invisible, I think, to international relations scholars because we don't talk to those people and we don't think about it very much. Um, but, uh, but it's also the case that citizens groups are interested in norms. They're busily trying to cultivate norms. States are busily trying to cultivate norms. This is a very decentralized governance mechanism. Um, the power and authority to create norms is dispersed across a large number of actors, states, but also firms, civil society groups, individuals. So treaties are very different. Treaties are instruments of the state. Treaties are instruments of state power. But again, there's a disconnect here. I mean, the internet, as we know it, does not belong to states. 95% of the networks around the world are in private hands, owned by private entities, companies. Um, and, and to listen to national governments talk, especially militaries, militaries forget this. Like they, they own the nuclear weapons, they own the battleships, and they think this is that kind of a problem. They don't own the networks. It is not their network. They own little teeny corners of the internet. They don't own most, of, they don't own what's on your phones. And they, I, I, it's just very strange conversations sometimes with uh, Pentagon people about this. They forget this problem. Uh, but because the internet is not held by states, again, there's this mismatch between state power and you know, governing this privately held resource of the internet. But the privately held resource of the internet is that rapid technological change that has brought so much economic growth, enhanced military power that states value. If you want the creativity, the dynamism in the internet, in digital world to continue, you need a rulemaking system that is going to allow this diverse array of actors to have a say and organize it going forward. I mean, the term of art we use for this in, uh, in the policy discussions is this is a multi, they want a multi-stakeholder model of governance for the internet rather than the alternative, which would be a multilateral form of governance. A multilateral form of governance is uh, a governance among states. You get a seat at the table because you're a state, because you have political power. And we talk a lot about multilateralism in international relations. It means a lot of states. Uh, if it's a multilateral agreement, it has lots of states. Multi-stakeholder is different. Multi-stakeholder means anyone who is affected by the rules, anyone with a stake in the outcome, gets a say and what the rules are. And, and this term, I think, did not come out of cybersecurity. I first heard it in development policy, economic development policy. I mean, development projects that are designed from the top down, where you know, national governments design things and say, go ye forth and do this in the villages, often fail. And they fail because the people at the top just don't know enough about the ground level details uh, to make good decisions at such a fine-grained level. And the recipients of development assistance often don't react very well to having outsiders boss them around. So this multi-stakeholder model was adopted for economic development and uh, has a large number of proponents as a better way to do development policy. The logic is the same, I think, in cybersecurity. The idea is you'll get better rules if you have more involvement by people at, diff at all levels of interaction on the network. How exactly they're going to organize this is, uh, remains to be seen. I think that's tricky. Uh, but, I, but I would say this, that um, their suspicion about top-down organization um, is wide and deep. Certainly in the United States, this is true. There is deep suspicion that the government just does not know enough about the technology to make good rules. I'm, I suspect this was not broadcast in Moscow, but it was all over Twitter uh, a month or so ago when they called Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, before the US Congress to be interrogated. The level of ignorance demonstrated by senators in the US Senate was truly breathtaking. So we discovered, for example, that one powerful senator, Lindsey Graham, did not know the difference between Twitter and Facebook. 
okay? And Orrin Hatch did not know how Facebook could stay in business without when its services were free and they didn't charge any money, which shows he does not understand advertising. So, I mean, but the idea that you would put those people in charge of making rules makes the business community very, very nervous. They just don't think that the knowledge is there. And again, this, this how, do, how do, do technologists talk to policymakers is a very difficult conversation. And in this area of policy, it's a hugely difficult uh, conversation. So the policy challenge here, I think, is complicated. They need rules for cybersecurity that will govern a lot of different kinds of actors, states, firms, individuals. They need rules that are going to change quickly in response to technology changes, and they need rules that a lot of people will see as good, right rules and will voluntarily comply with. Because if they're not, you know, states will enforce the treaties. That's the big upside to treaties. If they want that nimbleness, if they want that multi-stakeholder model, they need to craft rules that people will buy into and be persuaded, yep, this is a good rule. So norms seem to be the tool that people want to try. Um, and the hope is that they'll be more flexible, more nimble as a way of coordinating rules than treaties are. Um, and you know, we'll see if this works. I, 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 am, I am curious. The enthusiasm has not died. It is, in fact, picking up steam. And I, I think they will be successful on some levels, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I think it's also hard, going to be harder than they think it's going to be. Um, but to pick up on the third, uh, the, the other research question I laid out, these people are enthusiastic about norms as a tool. They want norms. How could they create them? And, and this is how they ended up calling me on the phone or sending me an email. Um, the international relations scholarship world has done a lot of work on how you create norms and how you change old ones. And we have models. Uh, we discussed several of these yesterday in a roundtable. We have models about how norms get promoted, how norms get spread. There's a big literature now on norm entrepreneurs, people who have a new norm. They want to persuade other people that this is the right norm. They want to diffuse this, to spread it, to get it written into rules and legislation. Uh, and we have a lot of examples where this has succeeded. We know a little bit about the kinds of patterns that might succeed or fail. But this is an art more than a science. Uh, there are, though, I think the, when I talk to policymakers about this, often I talk to them more about norm creation as a, a strategic choice problem. I mean, they need to think clearly about some of the obvious strategic choices uh, in front of them as they try to cultivate a new norm. And I wrote an article in the American Journal of International Law with a, a legal colleague, uh, Duncan Hollis, trying to lay out some of these choices. Because these norm entrepreneurs are not simply standing on the street corner saying, oh, like my norm, please, like my norm. No, they are not doing that. They are very savvy and sophisticated about how they promote. And I have a list of questions and problems for them in this article that they can take apart to try to guide them through this thought process. If you wanted to put out a new cyber norm that was uh, going to help you, that would make the world a better place, that would make the internet more secure and more stable, how would you do it? The first choice, you have to make a series of choices. And I would argue the first choice you have to be very clear in your own head about is exactly what problem are you trying to solve? Digital technologies are a huge policy space. There are so many issues and so many problems that you could solve. Do you want norms to solve hardware and software engineering problems? Problems that might create vulnerabilities that criminals or military adversaries could exploit. That would be one kind of world in which you could promote norms. It is very different from another kind of world. Do you want norms to address content issues? 
what people say, the, the content of what people say and do on the internet. Do you want norms, for example, about there shouldn't be child pornography on the internet or there shouldn't be hate speech on the internet? That's a very different policy problem. It's a very different set of government actors. It's a very different set of civil society actors who care about that and have ideas about that. You're talking to totally different people. If that's the kind of norm you want to put forward, then if you want to do technology norms. Um, and those are very different from if you want norms to address offensi offensive digital weapons and escalation dangers of various kinds that um, cyber weapons might pose in warfare situations. Now then you probably want to be talking to military people and military strategists who are not spending their days thinking about hate speech or pornography or any of these other things. So different groups uh, of actors are in very different places, having very different conversations about creating norms on the internet. And as a policymaker, you need to be clear in your own head which ones you think are important because you're talking to a different array of partners, a different group. You're trying to shape the expectations of very different groups depending on what you choose and what you think is important. So step one is to think about exactly what problem you want to tackle. Step two is how do you want to frame this problem when you approach people to persuade them? What kind of problem exactly do you think you have here? And more specifically, whose behavior is the problem that you want to fix? You know, whose behavior needs to change to make the world work according to the norms and rules that you're trying to pursue? And often there are choices to be made here, strategic choices, how you frame the problem, what kind of problem you think it is. Some problems are easier to solve than other problems. And as a smart policymaker, you need to weigh those possibilities and decide where your efforts might be best spent. The way you, one, one important thing is the way you frame the problem and the way you frame the norm that you want to propose assigns responsibility. It clarifies whose problem this is, who has to do what to fix the problem. And some problem solvers are more flexible and more interested in hearing your point of view than other problem solvers. So uh, you might have to make choices. Let me give an example. Let's say you were worried about cyber attacks on your civilian infrastructure, uh, your power plants, your, high, your hospitals, your electric grid. You're worried about uh, cyber attacks on your infrastructure by another state's military. This is a big worry. All states worry about this. Big dams, uh, big electrical grids are all plugged into the internet now. They're, digitally dependent and they are digitally vulnerable in breathtaking ways. If an adversary can hijack uh, your code and open up that big river dam and let all the water out, if they can shut down your power grid and shut off all power to the city and the hospitals and everybody else, a lot of people could die. You could say this is a problem of bad behavior by militaries. You know, one military is going to attack another country and do all these bad things. If that's what you're worried about, you're worried about bad, in your view, bad behavior by another military, your partners for this have to be other militaries. And you would frame your conversation around humanitarian protection, the Talon manuals, laws of war that protect civilians. But, but the people you're trying to create a shared expectation with are other militaries. You could take the same problem, though, and frame it in a very different way. You could say, no, no, no. The people whose behavior I want to change is not the other militaries. Maybe I think I'll never change their behavior. Maybe I can't talk to them, whatever. You, but you could say there are other people I can talk to. I could say this is a civil defense problem. And the norms you want to promote are norms for engineering specifications and best practices for building the networks, for hardening civilian infrastructure, 
for regulating the power plants and the electric grids that you could, might even be able to control better as a national political authority. You can actually, them you can make laws about and you can enforce those laws. And you can create specifications of best practices as they build forward new, new networks and other kinds of uh, components of the internet. Good engineering practices, best practices among engineers. So here the target of your norm building is not a foreign military, it's engineers and technologists and software developers. That might be an easier path forward. Now these are not mutually exclusive. If you're a savvy government, you're going to do both of these things, right? You're going to be having your military people talk to the military guys, but you can also do these other things. And learning where you can make progress is part of the art of diplomacy and the art of governing. And good norm entrepreneurs know this and will look to make progress on norms where they can. I mean, the, th the third uh, choice you have to make, I think, if you're a policy person, is about what I would call the breadth of the norms that you want to propose versus the depth of the norms you want to propose. Do you want to propose norms and rules that lots of states and lots of actors will comply with? Or do you only need a few to comply or buy into your shared expectations to accomplish the goals that you care most about? Um, an example here might be uh, one of the things that the U.S. has worried about extensively and has gotten a lot of media attention is uh, the U.S. government and U.S. businesses have been concerned for decades now about uh, intellectual property theft from, by China from U.S. firms and U.S. government. I mean, this has been a huge source of a uh, huge uh, difficulty in U.S.-Chinese relations for ages now. Um, and uh, there was a big concern about how can we manage this relationship so that they'll stop doing this. To us, this looks like theft. And they say, no, 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 we're just borrowing what's out on the internet. Uh, in 2014, Obama and Xi came to an agreement to curb this kind of what the U.S. views as intellectual property theft. And that was just two countries. Um, but they were two really big and important countries. So after the Obama-Xi agreement, you get Germany weighing in and saying, oh, we'll sign on to that agreement. Then the UK, the Britain, Great Britain signs on and says, we'll sign on to that agreement. Then the entire G20 signs on and says, oh, that looks good to us too. So this spreads, and, and this is common. If you can get sort of the first agreement the first set of shared expectations among key actors, often there's a spreading effect that can be very helpful for you as you try to promote these understandings. It's, it's an example of the dynamic character of these norms that I talked about earlier. Um, another different strategy can be, so the Obama-Shi agreement is I'm going to talk with the person that I disagree with most. If we can solve that, other people will sign on. The other strategy is, let's build a norm among the people who already mostly agree. Can we clarify our agreements? Sh develop a norm among ourselves? And then, once other states see this is not scary, it works, it's helping those states, sure, we'll follow their lead, we like that norm, and we'll start to follow that norm. Um, that's another way norms sometimes spread. The Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, for example, started out as a Council of Europe agreement, um, but then non-European states started signing on. They also wanted their law enforcement to start working uh, to harmonize law enforcement procedures around different kinds of cybercrime, online crime problems. So just to wrap up, I mean, I think these digital technologies are enormously consequential for all of us, and they will be for many years to come. Governments depend heavily on this technology. Militaries cannot fight a war without these technologies in the 21st centuries. It's just impossible. The planes won't fly. The tanks won't roll without these technologies. 
And businesses can't manufacture and distribute products in any sector anymore. Everything has a chip in it now. So if we can't come up with some common rules, life is going to get complicated and large numbers of actors are out there busily trying to shape these shared understandings. Um, to the extent they succeed and where they succeed, that success will shape what's possible for the rest of us. And you know, there's a lot of room for people like you to get involved in this. This is going to be important in your life longer than it's going to be important in my life. So, so thanks very much to all of you for listening and I'd be happy to talk with you. <laughs> No, thank you for that. Uh, I think you've, again, you've identified something that is potentially enormously powerful. And, and I would step back and say there's a sort of, this is potentially professional norms, norms of professions. Law enforcement, they think of them, they are professionals at what they do. They go to academies, they're highly trained. If you can uh, develop shared notions about what good law enforcement looks like and put it into the academies of different cities, different countries, you, that would help greatly over time harmonize the way police officers think about the problem because you know you're students right you have to listen to the people up here talk to you about things and you all take notes and you learn if you can get people when you're training them they're all eager to learn about this you know the students often know more than the old folks about these technologies so if you could uh, get into the academies uh, and the training uh, academies, if, if the people who run the academies, for example, in the Council of Europe or elsewhere, actually talk to each other and, and within Interpol, if they can get down to that level, that would be one way to spread the norm. Another is they also do a lot of mid-course professional training, right? To be promoted, often you have to take a course uh, if you want a new job or a better job. If you can get a cybersecurity component into those trainings, and if people are learning similar things across national borders, it will be easier for them to talk to each other. They'll have similar expectations about what counts as a crime and what we're gonna do about it. That'll make it easier for them to catch bad guys, which I would think is, sounds good to me. I don't like bad guys, so, okay. <clears throat> Uh, please, and then go for you first, and then you. <laughs> One, two, okay. <laughs>
In a funny way, I think there's actually a connection maybe between these two questions in the following sense. Um, I think that, uh, ep uh, I, I, as I think about epistemic communities, they're communities of knowledge. Uh, they are uh, communities that share bodies of knowledge, which could be of quite diverse kinds. So professional knowledge would be one subset, as I think about it, you know, are the law enforcement officers and the Interpol people have an epistemic community of a kind. They have a shared body of knowledge. Some of it's technical, but some of it's social. You know, how do you deal with people and what's right and appropriate? And, uh, but often the epistemic community, the epistemic community is not, concept is much, much larger than this. Um, I, I think that these changing technologies pose challenges for a lot of the epistemic communities. Bodies of knowledge have to change, or most of the ones I'm interested in, anyway, have to change. So biotechnology, they, this was a crisis in their community when this event happened. They had been having these little abstract academic conferences about the ethics of CRISPR technology, and suddenly now they're confronted with something that they have to do something about today. And how they're going to sort that out, I don't know. It's a pretty robust community. So my guess is the community's not going to disappear anytime soon. One of the things, though, that might happen is it, the community's relationships with government, with industry, might become strained in a variety of ways. If, for example, in, if in the example you gave, uh, large numbers of scientists refuse to work for the companies or the government agencies that are sponsoring this technology because ethically they think it's unprincipled and bad, that would create a very interesting political conflict that as an IR scholar I would want to know about. They can be, a, they can be a, the, uh, clashes, disagreements in understandings can be important political cleavages that would matter a lot. And, and I see this in the cyber world often. The technologists have very different views often than, uh, let's say, government intelligence services about how they want to build out the technology. This, in, in the United States, we've been having this decades-old conversation about whether uh, commercial software companies are required to build in what is colloquially known as a back door so that law enforcement can get into your iPhone and read everything. If they suspect you of a crime, can they get into your iPhone and find out everything you've been doing and everyone you know? The technology community and the business community, Apple, sells its product saying, we sell a product with end-to-end -end and no back doors, and that's a big selling point. That's why people buy them. So they have big money invested in having no such option. Um, uh, when the, we had a shooting in a town called San Bernardino where the police very much wanted into the shooter's phone and Apple was refusing to let them into the phone. And this is an epistemic community fight in some ways. The technologists not only have a body of knowledge, they have a body of ethics about what they think is good engineering. And the, the law enforcement people have a very different view. I want to, you know, find out what's going on with the bad guys and so I really need in. Um, this was a huge fight. Um, so I think there's this very interesting intersection here. Knowledge is power in a particular way. It shapes um, how people behave, but it's dynamic. It has to react to new situations, and how it does that is, well, it's a great research project for people like me, so I'm selfish, I think, at the end. So, please. <clears throat>
I'm going to have to disappoint you. I'm so sorry. I don't know a lot about artificial intelligence. I had, this was another set of phone calls, though, that I got. They are interested in trying to figure out, they are running into some of the related ethical problems to the biotech guys, right? So, um, and, uh, so the technology community is very interested in pushing the technology forward. What more new things can it do? But there are civil society actors, government, a lot of people who are worried about unintended consequences of this. And I just don't know enough to have great wisdom. I apologize. I just don't know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Um, I have a question to frame back to your point about the And you're, that is a very, very common, maybe ubiquitous situation. I guess, um, well, maybe let me take, take half a step back and say, I think that in, in the practical real world, uh, their shared expectations among any large group of people always have wrinkles. I think of them as wrinkles. Wrinkles in them. Um, they're uneven. Uh, and they can be uneven a in a lot of different ways. And there's good research on, on various aspects of this. Um, people can share with different levels of conviction. Like, you are really a gung-ho believer in this norm. And the person sitting next to you might be, eh, yeah, well, it's OK. Yeah, I'm not going to fight it too hard. Uh, so there can be different levels of commitment to the norm. Um, but the other thing that can happen is situations where people share an expectation about correct behavior, but they do it for very different reasons. Um, the, uh, there's a scholar named Cass Sunstein who in American law teach, uh, uses an American legal example which is uh, enshrined in our constitution is uh, freedom of religion. And uh, you might believe in religious liberty and everybody in the United States might agree in religious liberty, but they might do it for really different reasons. One group might say, I believe in religious liberty because uh, I don't want to be persecuted. I have a religious belief and I'm afraid someone will persecute me, so I think this sounds like a great, everybody should believe this. Somebody else might not be religious at all, but say, um, well, I'm not religious at all, but People fight all the time about religion. If we just have religious liberty, they'll stop fighting. It sounds like a good recipe for social peace. Mm, sure, I'll, I think religious liberty sounds good too. You can have, you could believe in the same norm, but for very different kinds of reasons. And um, that can be quite stable for a very long time. I mean, occasionally events, if people are believing in the norm for different reasons, or uh, then, Events, big events might happen that fracture the consensus on this. Um, but it's not unusual for people to, or to go back to the high heels and neckties. You know, you might be wearing a necktie because you want to get the job and you want to impress the person who's um, off, who you're interviewing for the job with, or you might uh, do it because your girlfriend gave you the necktie and you, uh, you know, said goodbye to her and she thought you looked so nice. I mean, you could have a lot of different reasons for wearing the necktie. Um, uh, why, but the behavior is the same. You're still wearing a necktie at the job interview. Um, so the motivations can be diverse. And sometimes that's a good thing. It might be helpful to have a lot of different kinds of people behave the same way. Doesn't, you don't care why they behave the same way. You just want, you care about the behavior. Um, other times you might care about why they're doing it. That's harder. That's a harder social engineering to do. So... Please, yeah.
I hadn't thought about it in quite this way before, so this, thank you, this is helpful. Um, uh, for example, the transition question that you raised, I can imagine uh, that over time, if you have a multi-stakeholder model that begins to create shared expectations, it might facilitate multi agreement among states as well. I mean, there might be a virtuous circle where uh, more, more success on the multi-stakeholder model actually helps multilateral negotiations in the abstract. Uh, that sounds perfectly plausible to me. Um, my, my worry about um, the extent to which multi-stakeholder will turn into multilateral, though, is this point that I made before about the diversity of constituents. I, I think that uh, it would take a, for uh, for governments one of the pro, one of the challenges is. I, the American saying for this would be, how do you how do you regulate digital politics without killing the goose that lays the golden egg, right? If you put heavy-handed government regulation on these companies, these are very val valuable companies. They have a lot of jobs. They create much to the wealth of the country. If I regulate them, will that undercut? this very valuable industry. And so my worry is whether if uh, governments don't provide space for the industry, this multi-stakeholder model to work and try to shut it down, you know, if they want to move it all to multilateral, I'm, I, I'm just not clear how we're gonna get to a world where the government is smart enough to do that and maintain the kind of commercial dynamism or technological dynamism that we are all used to as we see new and improved iPhones every other year. So I, I'm just, I, I, I hear military people talk this way sometimes. Anyone in the commercial sector I think would not be persuaded. And those groups don't talk to each other enough. Um, at least they certainly don't in the United States. The conversation between Silicon Valley and Washington DC is often a very incomplete, uneven conversation. Um, I don't know how it works in other countries, but we don't internally, inside, forget international, domestically we don't have a good conversation about this. So we'll see, I don't know how this will work. You've been patient, please. That's an important model and an interesting uh, one to think about. Actually, could somebody, how much time do we have? I don't even know when this is over. I know you have places to go, so. We have 10, min 10 minutes? 11. 11 minutes, okay. Just, I just wanted to know, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the Chinese, um, it's not just China, as you pointed out, that wants, would like to be able to wall off uh, and have much more sovereign control over their internet. Um, uh, and in fact, I gather China has been interested in selling that technology to other governments. Pakistan, I hear this only through rumors. I don't, I mean, I read this in the press. I don't have any inside information. The Pakistan's interested in this. I'm sure other governments are interested in this. Um, and, and as an outsider with no particular expertise, 
expertise. Um, my, the big question I would ask about this is whether the technology alone can accomplish those goals. Or do you need the Chinese Communist Party to also come with the technology to be able to implement it in ways that achieves those results that the Chinese have achieved? Right? There are two things interacting here. There's the technology and what it can theoretically do, but then there's how people use it. And uh, the Chinese have a whole elaborate social and political structure that interacts with the technology to create the great firewall and the um, technological, you know, very impressive technological competence, but also control that they're able to exercise with this. And, and the question is, do even if other countries just buy the technology, because China sells it to them, do they have the social and political arrangements that will allow them to implement it and get the same effect? I say, I pose that as a question. I just don't know. I, but when I watch people, different people use the same technology, I see pretty high variation. I'd be surprised if you get exactly the same effects if you just pick it up and move it to a whole new country. But I'm not an expert. That's pure speculation on my part. So, please, yeah? My question is, how do you... I'm probably not going to get all the history right here, so forgive me if I make errors, but my, my understanding is that in broad strokes, what counts as government and what counts as private, uh, there's some gray space here. Um, so when the internet starts, it's an academic, uh, well, it's, it's an academic research project funded by the Defense Research Agency, DARPA. Um, and the, uh, what, 1970s or whenever it was. Uh, and it starts off with five uh, universities, I think, are working on this. Most of them are in California, uh, at Stanford and Berkeley, and I can't remember where else. Um, and they're developing this technology. Uh, what, and so it's... I don't, I don't know whether universities count as public or private in the way you're thinking about this. You know, Stanford is a private university in American terms, but a lot of their research is funded on government grants. And so what is that? Is that private or public? It's not commercial in that sense. So the, what happened, my understanding of the history, and again, I'm not sure I have this entirely right, is this is the 1990s, this is the Bill Clinton administration. And Bill Clinton gets interested in this in the 1990s. Uh, and it's in 19, it, uh, uh, it's w Tim Berners-Lee, what, builds out the first web page in 98, if that's close, I think it's something like that. And it's at that point that Bill Clinton makes the decision uh, that the U.S. Department of Commerce, this is moved from DARPA to the U.S. Department of Commerce, I'm not sure when, and the U.S. De Commerce, Department of Commerce decides that they will allow businesses to you know, build out web pages on this technology that's been developed, uh, which gives us the World Wide Web over time that we know. That's a very incomplete history uh, of this. So there is a, there's a decision which is a, a permissive decision in that it's not that the U.S. government owns, does anything, it built the initial technology, and this is common for governments. Uh, certainly it's a common strategy for the U.S. government. It, it puts in place, it provides seed, we call it seed money, right? You're planting a seed. And it gives scientific labs money to carry out basic research. But when the applications start to become obvious, and it becomes obvious that it might have commercial applications, Free enterprise is a powerful endeavor in the United States, and so there was commercial, you know, commercial actors got interested in using this technology, and 
the Clinton administration decided, okay. Um, uh, but I, the government doesn't, the, the, but the networks are built out by private companies. They're built out by AT&T and Verizon and all these um, private companies. They're not built out by the US government. At least in the United States, it's private actors who own all these networks. Uh, so all the US government is doing is saying, we allow this. We allow you private people to build these computer networks, to link them together, to carry out commercial activity on this. And there are pieces where the government, again, had to appear in a regulatory notion, mostly, um, you know, for a long time they ran the domain name system, and they ran it out of this strange little outfit called ICANN in Santa Monica, California, or someplace. Um, and they have had that used, the Department of Commerce used to run that, but that oh, it was only recently that they, Span, it spun that off into a, I guess we'd call it an um, international organization, a non-governmental organization. Um, but it's no longer run by the US Department of Commerce anymore. It's run by an international body. So um, I wouldn't, so it's private in the sense only that commercial actors invested the money. It wasn't US government money that's building all these computer networks. It's companies, and why do they do it? It's not because they're good people, it's because they want to sell us stuff, and they've been very successful. I mean, how many things have you bought today on your phone? I mean, a lot of things. So, um, I, I, I don't want to make them seem like they're angelic people. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're nice, but, so. Please? I'm not sure there is one main driving force in that I, when I said that I, no, the, the, this entire creation of norms enterprise is very, very decentralized. So there are, you know, there are a large array of actors who are trying to push norms and you have a lot of company in being concerned about your privacy around the world. Uh, there are you know, national level organizations worried about this. There are big international, mostly NGOs who are interested in this and often they're successful. The Europeans, for example, have, European governments have been lobbied by citizens groups and have a very different notion of privacy than the Americans do. It's a much stricter level of privacy than the Americans do. And uh, the Americans have been so slow on exactly this problem, the Europeans moved much faster and my sense of this now is that the Americans and certainly all American companies now have no choice but to comply with EU privacy standards. And it's a, it's a timeline issue. The Europeans got out front first. They put in place clear rules. Do you want to do business in Europe? Apple says yes. Microsoft says yes. So now suddenly here I am in the United States and I'm getting all these little pop-up messages that say we comply with the European privacy directives and click here if you accept. Because uh, they're going to warn me about all the data they're going to collect from me on this website. So I think that the uh, power to set norms on a whole lot of issues is highly diffused, and in your issue, I would say the Europeans and the European civil society organizations are extremely well organized and very articulate about these issues. They seem to be getting change better than, certainly better than any of my American colleagues are on, on this issue. But I don't think there is one. I think on different issues, it's different 
norm, different people are leading. I'm not sure that's bad. It might, having multiple centers of power might be okay. Um, I'm, I guess maybe I should withhold judgment. I don't know how this will come out in the end. How are we doing on time? Are we done? Okay, sorry. The bosses were done. <laughs>